We're ready for questions. All right, Paul. Sean asks, I have a private pilot's license, single engine land, conventional aircraft from 1988. I let my third class medical expire. I did not fail it. Could I now get sport pilot weight shift with just my driver's license? Yes, you can. See, you're in great shape. I've, you're just the same as the airplane pilot. You, had, you, probably, you probably have the old paper certificate. If you call me up and ask me, what do you do? You, take your, you call the FAA up and said, hey, I want my new plastic green pilot's license. And you give me your information on your old paper. And you are good to go. So you're way ahead, even though you haven't done it for a long time. That pilot's license is good for life. So the answer is yes, you're ready to go with your old pilot's license. You will not have to take a knowledge test, and you do not have to solo to be able to get your weight shift. Okay. <clears throat> Doug asks, how can you carry camping, maintenance, and cross-country stuff in a trike? Well, if you are on your own, that back seat can carry all that. Now, if you've got another person, then it's going to be more difficult. One of the guys is, uh, oh, I forget what the name was, but he is flying around the world with two people. They have camping gear. They've got it strapped to the outside of the trike. It looks like a mess, but they've basically got it strapped to the outside. Uh, so they, they take that and They've, they're flying around the world with camping gear, sleeping bags, food, uh, everything. So some of the more, oh, one of the new modern trikes has huge saddle bags to put stuff in. But if you're going to be flying around with one person, you've got plenty of room in the back. See, if you're going to be flying with two pe people, you're going to have to strap it on the on the side, and that is is going to you know it's going to add weight, drag, and everything else. But it is done. Guy's going around the world right now. Okay. Uh, Pete asks, uh, he lost audio for a moment. He's an ATP with CFI. What are my options or requirements for trikes? Okay. Well, I already went over this in the presentation, but if you want to, if you're an ATP, you got an ATP license and you haven't failed your medical, you, you need to be, you can be trained by one CFI take a check, uh, I'm sorry, a proficiency check with another CFI to get your weight shift control pilot uh, add-on. And if you're a CFI, you do the exact same thing to add the weight shift control trike onto your CFI. Be trained by one CFI and take a proficiency check with another CFI to add that weight shift control uh, privilege on to your existing CFI license. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Eugene asks, who can repair exper experimental trike electronics? <laughs> as I as I joke with people, a monkey can work on an experimental. Um, anyone can work on an experimental. Now, who can? Now, to, to, to really answer your, your question, how do you find someone qualified to fix your electronics? That would be pretty much, you know, anybody. Are, is there a specialty place, you know, around you? That's going to be a tough one. You're going to have to find someone who is good at electronics, but you do not have to have any qualifications whatsoever to uh, repair or troubleshoot and figure out electronics on an experimental. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, Jim asks, is there an additional endorsement required for amphibious trikes? Yes, but let's just say you have your land trike. If you want to add water to that, then you can take a proficiency, ch uh, you, you're trained by one CFI, and take a proficiency check to add that on uh, to that. Because with an amphibious trike, you need a land rating and you need a sea rating. And typically, you would get your land rating first 
and then add on the C rating. Okay. Michael asks, as a private pilot with lots of hang gliding experience, is the weight shift control add-on an endorsement or considered just transition training? No, no, that would be, if you're a private pilot and you, you, you want to go to weight shift control, that is transition training. And that's going to take, if you're a private pilot already, you can be trained by one CFI and then take a proficiency check with another CFI. Now your hang gliding experience, I've had a lot of hang glider pilots, private pilots, commercial, et cetera, et cetera, who, who have a lot of hang gliding experience and they pick up everything really fast until it comes time to landing, for landing, then everything slows down. But flying the weight shift control is just like flying a hang glider. Uh, if you want to add that, the hang gliding experience is going to help you and also, if you're a power power pilot, uh, an airplane pilot, then the landing should get easier, should be much easier now. The private pilot with hang gliding experience should transition pretty easy. Again, you need to be trained by one CFI and take a proficiency check with another. So in other words, your hang gliding experience doesn't count for anything except for your actual experience flying the bar to turn and speed. Okay. <clears throat> Gerald asks, can a weight shift control craft be slipped to lose altitude quickly like you do when cross controlling a normal airplane? Well, sort of. What does that mean? Generally, as you're flying, that weight shift control trike is pointed right into the wind, just like an arrow. If you bank it way up, a 60 degree bank, push it out a little bit, pull it in a little bit, it will slip a little bit. You don't want it to slip much because as it slips, you kind of lose a little bit of the control. But to answer your question, if you want to lose altitude, generally, no, it doesn't slip because it's always flying right into the wind. But if you spiral it, Yes, you can lose altitude pretty quick, and some of the wings will slip more than others, uh, but that's kind of getting into your, your advanced techniques. So generally, no, it doesn't slip. Okay, Susan asks, how strong do you need to be uh, to do weight shift? Is there a lot of force on the bar? Well, that is a good question. Th there is more force than there is flying an airplane stick or a wheel. Right now, you're kind of looking at a picture. We got a, a young lady, Michaela Flint, CFI. She's very lightweight, lighter weight than me. I only weigh 140. And she's, she's flying that high-powered, fast airplane of mountain turbulence. Yes, it does take some muscle. When I was first training her, I said, hey, you know, have you done your push-ups and pull-ups? But if you're flying it and it's in calm air, if you're flying a stiff wing, yeah, it takes a, it takes some force to move it. If you're flying a light a light high performance wing, it takes very little effort to move it. If you're flying it in calm air, you could say that that it doesn't take much force, a little bit. But if you get into turbulence or really bad turbulence, now you have to generally control the wing and the undercarriage with your muscles. Generally, yes, it takes more effort than an airplane. We try and train you to not fly in turbulence. Generally, most pilots don't fly, don't like to fly in turbulence. I mean, I fly in turbulence quite a bit, and it doesn't mean I have to like it, but I do fly in it. Additionally, as you learn to fly, your muscles become adept to the motions. There's your answer. It will take more effort, but it's not that much. Okay, Dale asks, can you remove a seat on a trainer to make a vehicle become a no-license ultralight? <laughs> well, no. Have people done that and try and get away with it? Yes. But you've got the weight is one thing. And the FAA doesn't really weigh these as, as much as they used to. There's a really funny story, which I won't tell about the FAA weighing them, but they don't weigh them much. There's other requirements, such as five gallons of fuel, 
stall speed, that's usually not. So it usually comes down to single seat. Typically, in a two-place, if you remove the seat, it's not going to meet the weight requirements. And the gas tank's probably going to be bigger than five gallons. So basically, no. Uh, do people do that and try and get away with it? Uh, yes. Does it work? I'm not sure. Paul, what engine are you typically, you're run, typically running on the two-place? That's a great question here. When I first started flying the trikes, I was flying a 503, 50 horsepower. It was a bigger wing, a lightweight trike. I flew that thing up to 17,000 feet. I flew that, that little 50 horsepower Carson down up to Mount Whitney, out to Death Valley, back up cross country. I'd fly, I'd fly that little 50 horsepower across the Sierras. Then I went to a 582, the 65 horsepower two-stroke. Then I went to a 912, 100 horsepower carbureted engine. Now I fly the, tri the uh, both those trikes you see in the picture, all, well, all three, are all the fuel-injected Rotax 912 engine. So basically now I fly the 912 fuel-injected why do I do that? Why do I? Why am I not flying the 503? Because with a 9, 12, 100 horsepower, I can fly a smaller wing, and I'm bumped around less as I head up over the mountains, and it's faster. When you're trying to just, it goes back to what lifestyle do you want? You can get the Rotex 50 horsepower, 503, which they don't make anymore, unfortunately with a big wing, lightweight, if you want to just cruise around in not that much wind, not go that high, and have fun. So, so this is where, when it comes down to deciding which trike you want and which engine, you can go all the way from the, the lightweight, slow, slower, bigger wing with a 50 horsepower, up to the 912 fuel-injected, high-altitude, bumps, high wind, fast aircraft. Okay, Doug asks, do trikes ride easier in turbulence than airplanes generally? And also he asks, can you fly hands off? Is there trim? Yes, trikes are more susceptible to turbulence because when you get into turbulence, it takes a little bit more strength. In an airplane, when I get into turbulence, just a little bit more action on the stick. So generally, yes, trikes are more susceptible. When I'm looking at my limitations of bumps over the Sierra Nevada mountains with a trike, it's like 20 to 25 at 9,000. With the airplane, I go 25 to 30. I tone it down about five knots for crosswind landings with a trike. Generally, your limitation is a little bit more with a trike than with the airplane. Far as trimming it in calm air, just like an airplane, you can have that thing flying, you can take your hands off the bar, it flies along at whatever trim speed you got. It might roll to the left a little bit, just like an airplane would. Yes, you can let go of that bar and it trims and flies beautifully with hardly any effort in calm winds couple of questions around insurance. What, if any, insurance is available for trikes, and do you need it in order to solo a trike? Insurance is a moving target. You can buy insurance. I get asked this question all the time, and I'm, I'm no insurance expert. And yes, there is insurance available, and it depends, you know, what kind of insurance do you want? Do you want liability? Do you want hull coverage? Do you want kind of insurance do you want? If you come to fly my trike, then I make you buy your insurance. And that would be for liability and hull coverage. That would be, oh, I forget what it is exactly. I have you insure it for about, my trike for rent for about 50,000. And I think the insurance is about five or 600 per year. You can get that on a shorter term, term basis. Then it comes down to non-owned aircraft. That insurance is very um, 
cheap, depending upon if, if you want hull coverage. When it comes to insurance, hull coverage, in other words, if you crack it up and you want your your aircraft covered for hull damage, that's, that's really expensive. When it comes just to liability, in other words, if you crash it into something, you want whatever you crash into covered. That's like your third-party liability. That's a lot less expensive. It depends, are you an owner, a non-owner, a CFI? It's just a full range of insurance subject that I'm no expert at. Doug asks, what's the max crosswind component? Well, that's like asking someone in an airplane, what's the max crosswind component? That depends on four things. Number one, how big is the wing? If it's a, if it's a big wing, you, you don't know how to fly it very well. The crosswind component might be five knots. If it's a small wing and you're very experienced at flying it, you could go with a 15 knot crosswind. So there's a full range on what the wing can handle, just like in an airplane. They, they give you the demonstrated crosswind. And when you first get your license, or when you first start flying, you should not be flying in that maximum demonstrated crosswind. I would say your crosswind limitation would be anywhere from five knots to 15 knots. The other thing is too, is if you're coming into an airport and there's a, a 15 knot crosswind, just like in an airplane, land on a taxiway, land on a different, land on a ramp, land wherever you want to land to not uh, have that total crosswind. To answer your question, five to 15 knots, depending on the situation. As an add-on question for that, so what is the typical takeoff landing distances? What, like, what kind of runway do you feel comfortable saying, yeah, you know, 1,000 feet or whatever it is? My takeoff distance at, let's just say, 6,000-foot density altitude with 100 horsepower small wings about 1,000 feet. I've flown some of the ultralights, and I can take off in probably 100 feet. So it's kind of just like an airplane. The higher power, bigger wings, you're going to take off in a lot less distance than your smaller wings, faster aircraft. So you're really going to range between 100 feet and 1,000 feet. Now this, again, this comes back to kind of choosing what you want to do. A scenario, you got, you got a ranch and you got 500 put, you can put a runway in. So now what you're going to do is you're going to go with a bigger wing. Bigger engine is good, but it tends to weigh a little bit more. So you're going to go with a bigger wing so you can take off and land in a shorter distance. Is that going to be a good wing for going up in the bumps and wind and going cross country? No. So it really depends on what your, what your mission is. Now, a lot of people do want to get a trike, put it in their garage or put it wherever. You have to get a trike designed for a short takeoff and landing distance. To answer your question, between 200 and 1,000 feet. Uh, James would like to know, are there any ultralight trikes for rent at weight shift flying schools? No, because an ultralight time does not count towards your sport pilot license because the way the FAA has it is that an ultralight is not an N-numbered registered aircraft it's just a vehicle. Now, this is the same for airplanes. The FAA does not consider ultralight to be an aircraft. So you will not find any ultralights. Well, I shouldn't say that. You could have an ultralight for rent, but it's not going to do you any good for solo to get your license. It could be rented for flying around. Insurance for an ultralight that's not a registered and numbered aircraft, that, that would probably be a mess there. So. Generally, the answer would be no. There would be no ultralights for rental, and it would not count towards your solo hours for your pilot certificate. Gary asks, can you have more than one wing per trike? Oh, that's a good that, that's I, mean, a good I think question. he's talking about different yep. sizes. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So, well, this is, one, this is one thing people do is they get an undercarriage, and then they get a big wing for short takeoffs and landings, and then you get a small wing if you want to fly in turbulence or cross country. So yeah, that's one of the advantages here. 
when you look at the cost of a trike, 80% of the cost is in the undercarriage. It's easy to get different wings and put them on there. Now, if it's a specialized sport aircraft, it's got to be certified for both wings. Yes, you can get a trike with a small wing and a large wing, and that's a great option for uh, two different missions. And you can have the same trike undercarriage. Okay, and Doug's wondering, how long and difficult is it to pull it out of, tra of the trailer and assemble it like you showed earlier? Again, it depends on, on the wing. If you have a double surface wing, more battens versus a single surface with less battens, I've seen people do it in 20 minutes. Now, this is people who are really experienced at it, have the routine down, a single surface wing, 20 minutes. It takes me about an hour. Whenever I do it, I, I pull it out. I'm in no hurry. I take about an hour. Now, if you take the wing off and put the wing on, double that hour. So what you really want to do is if you are, are going to be transporting it, you want to get it so it's got the struts underneath so you can pull it, pull the wings back. What the guys in Vegas were doing a long time is they all had their, their trailers. They would park the trailers at their house, head out to the dry lake bed. They all pull them out. They got really quick at doing it and efficient at doing it. They could pull them out and put them back in in 20 minutes. So can you tie, uh, what do you do, like when you're traveling, do you have to be in a hangar at night or how do you handle that? Sometimes when we did that big, long cross country, you, you can tie it down. When I go to the EAA stuff, I'd, li I'd li leave that thing set up all the time, just tie it down. The thing that gets the wings is the sun. So you're basically trying to keep it out of the sun. Or if you know there's going to be a big wind coming up, you can take it down for that. But no, when you go on a cross country, you just tie it up at the airport, just like an airplane. David asks, there are rigid wing hang gliders like the Ecstasy. Are yep. there rigid powered ultralights and are pilot uh, training requirements different from a flex wing powered ultralight? No, the fixed wing has pretty much stayed with the ultralight. What happened was that the hang glider guys, higher efficiencies, and so they went with the, uh, the ATOS, which is like the super high efficiency hang glider. And then, of course, that hang glider wing can handle the loads of an ultralight frame down below it. So that's why the rigid wing, semi-popular, that's a great soric trike. But that has not evolved to the two-place weight shift control. Will that happen in the future? There's a great business opportunity for someone <laughs> to make a rigid wing trike. Has it happened yet? No. Will it happen in the future? Maybe. It's a great idea. It would give us a lot more efficiency. Okay, Ronald asks about approach speeds and range for trikes. Approach speed, that's going to depend on the size of wing. Heavy trike, 12.5 meter wing, my approach speed on that is 70. Same as in my airplane. You get a bigger wing that's a lot slower. I remember one of the ultralight trikes I flew it. It hit the throttle, boom, before I knew that thing was up. That got to about 25 trim and about 30. I pulled the bar and I could get to about 30. So the approach on that particular weight shift control trike was 30. The approach on my trike is 70. So again, it depends on the, the size of the wing. When I say between 30 and 70, everything in between. As far as range goes, let's say we're burning that one slide I showed you. I flew from Phoenix back up to Carson. For range, the slower you go, the longer range you're going to get. On the particular flight that I showed you a picture of, the range of 150 miles, but that's a full speed. And that was where I would had a 14-gallon tank and I would land with four gallons. Now, if I wanted to extend that, I could extend that range dramatically to probably 200, maybe 220 miles, and that's what, that's with a 14-gallon tank. Back in the day when I was flying a little 503, I had a 12-gallon tank, and I had a little five-gallon tank that I would stick up in the back seat that I would be able to drain fuel. 
from that from that five gallon tank down to the down to the main tank. So I had I had like 17 gallons in that. The range depends on how big of a fuel tank, what the fuel burn, how fast you go. Let's just say you could go 200 miles is, would be a, a good round number. Maybe 300, but figure 200 miles is a reasonably good number for a range. Well, Paul, great presentation. I think we've answered almost all the questions. Any closing thoughts before we sign off? Oh, I just, I just want to tell you that those questions are great questions. The weight shift control is just one of those things a lot of people don't quite understand. Once you get to know them, they're a heck of a lot of fun. Anybody out there, if you're interested, visit my website and give me a call personally. I'd be happy to talk with you.